In this video blog, we discuss the international crime of aggression. Aggression is a crime involving the unlawful use of force, uh, armed force, by one country against another, as when one country invades another without legal justification. It's a crime committed by the political and military leaders of the invading country, the decision makers who initiate the aggression, who control it, uh, even if there are boots on the ground who are carrying out uh, the military action. And so the question we're gonna uh, examine here is can Vladimir Putin as the leader of Russia be held accountable, uh, criminally culpable for uh, the invasion of Ukraine? Uh, the Nuremberg Tribunal that prosecuted uh, uh, Nazi uh, leaders as war criminals after World War II famously referred to the crime of aggression, crimes against peace, as the supreme international crime. Uh, and, I, and I think what the tribunal was getting at is that all other war crimes sort of flow from aggression. That is, without the unlawful war, there would be no war crimes to begin with. And so sort of aggression uh, kind of uh, starts uh, uh, or opens the door to, to further atrocities. So these are some of the questions that General McDaniel and I are going to discuss in this uh, video blog entry. So to begin with, uh, there's this preliminary question of whether Russia's invasion of Ukraine is unlawful, whether it constitutes an unlawful act of aggression. And in my opinion, it's pretty clear uh, based on what we know, that the invasion violates international law. And let me just point out two um, recent developments that support that view. Uh, at the beginning of March, the United Nations General Assembly, sort of the representative assembly of all of the countries around the world, all of the countries send a representative to the United Nations General Assembly. That body uh, adopted a resolution titled Aggression Against Ukraine. And in that resolution, the General Assembly referred to Russia's military uh, action as aggression, as a violation of international law. And notably, 141 countries voted for that resolution. Only five countries voted against it. And among those five were Russia, Belarus, North Korea, it kind of shows you the, the neighborhood uh, in which uh, Russia is operating here. Another uh, recent development is an order issued by the International Court of Justice in mid-March. The International Court of Justice is the judicial arm of the United Nations, of the world community. And in that order, the International Court of Justice required Russia to immediately suspend its military operations in Ukraine. And in that order, the court noted the numerous civilian deaths and injuries that have resulted. Uh, the court referred to the destruction of buildings, uh, the impact on civilian access to food, water, and medical supplies. And I, so I, I think that there is uh, substantial support here for a view that Russia's invasion of Ukraine constitutes unlawful aggression. The question here is, can Vladimir Putin, as the leader of Russia, be held criminally responsible for having committed aggression? And there are some uh, challenges out there but when it uh, comes to addressing that question. So General McDaniel, why don't I turn things over to you uh, for your thoughts on that question? Can Vladimir Putin be held criminally responsible? Yeah, Professor Finnegan, with my military background, of course, I immediately start thinking about the principle of command responsibility. Uh, and I think that would apply to the crime of aggression uh, as much as it applies to other war crimes. Uh, and so the idea of command responsibility uh, is the idea that the, the superior officer, the military leader knows or should have known that war crimes are being committed by his troops. Uh, uh, or learns about them afterwards. It's a very expansive uh, doctrine when it comes to military leaders. And secondly, uh, 
fails to take steps uh, to prevent war crimes or fails to punish. Again, it can happen after the, it can, you can create a crime uh, you can create legal responsibility, criminal responsibility after the fact of the event, the war crime occurring to bring in the superior officer if he does not take steps to punish uh, those individuals uh, who are engaged in it. So when you consider those, um, the question becomes, is there a failure to take necessary uh, and full measures, uh, reasonable measures to prevent this from occurring and you look at sort of the actions uh, of, of, of Putin, then uh, a couple of really clear examples, you know, we had the atrocities in Bucha, which Professor Finnegan, you mentioned earlier, uh, and most of the different types of war crimes uh, that, you, that you listed, uh, you know, the dismemberment, uh, beheadings of civilians, shooting of civilians with their hands tied behind their back, indiscriminate shootings, as individuals are walking down the street, uh, form assassination and kidnapping of political leaders like mayors. It's just this long list. And that, that unit that was involved in doing that, the 64th Motorized Brigade, as it's been identified, was honored by uh, President Putin in a statement uh, just three days ago, you know, calling it uh, brave and honorable for its defense of the fatherland or the protection of the fatherland, I think was the language. Um, and then similarly, I, I think we've seen, you know, as soon as the convoy bogged down, as soon as this lightning attack that they expected to happen uh, and to capture Kiev failed, there was, a, uh, there was at least eight generals that have been identified who have been uh, reassigned or fired. Uh, so there's, there is clearly active involvement by uh, uh, sub superior officers here. Now, Putin being uh, a political leader, the Rome Statute sort of specifically talks about that at an Article 28, and it says there's a higher standard of knowledge necessary if it's a civilian superior. You have to show that they actually knew or consciously disregarded information, which would clearly indicate that subordinates were committing or about to commit law of war, international humanitarian law violations. And I think we have that based on those examples that I, that I gave you that uh, in this case, the leader of Russia, almost a dictator, clearly knew and was leading these activities. Uh, and again, uh, the other, the last example I would give you was uh, the, the promotion or the assignment of a new uh, general is uh, for command of the Ukrainian theater, uh, who was the one who was in charge in both uh, Syria uh, during the reducing Aleppo to rub, rubble and then was in charge of the second Chechen war uh, for about three years, which resulted in, in that area of just about being totally uh, uh, wiped out. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got clear indications that the tactics, uh, including against civilians and civilian population and civilian facilities, cities, uh, and specific types of facilities within the cities, where uh, civilians are, are going to be located or dependent on, that this is not a one-off, that this is, a, a, this is a military strategy that has been used by Russia repeatedly, as I said, in Chechnya, in Syria, and now in Ukraine, which I think clearly meets that higher definition under Article 28 of the Rome Statute for a political sub, a superior uh, uh, to be held uh, accountable uh, for war crimes, in, including the crime of aggression. No, I agree with that. I think one of the challenges is, uh, you know, even if um, a claim on the merits uh, alleging war crimes on behalf of Vladimir Putin would win out on the day, that is, you know, we could, you know, uh, he's a war criminal, bringing him to justice right. is another matter. Now, the Rome statute recognizes uh, as a crime, the crime of aggression. Um, but there are a couple of uh, important legal technicalities that might stand in the way of ever bringing Vladimir Putin to justice. The first is um, within the at the International Court of Justice, um, uh, proceedings in absentia, trials in absentia, are not permitted. So, in order uh, to bring Vladimir Putin to account before the International Criminal Court, he would have to be physically present there. Um, and there's that you know there seems to be uh, limited hope, at least uh, currently, 
uh, that he would ever be brought into custody and, and brought before the court. But the other legal technicality is that when it comes to the crime of aggression, only citizens of countries that are a party to the Rome statute may be prosecuted for that crime at the International Criminal Court. Russia is not a party to the Rome statute. And so effectively, Putin is off the hook, at least at the International Criminal Court, for the crime of aggression. As we've discussed earlier, other war crimes are treated differently uh, under that treaty and may be prosecuted at the ICC. The court has jurisdiction over citizens of Russia, the Russian military, who are acting within the territory of Ukraine uh, because Ukraine has accepted the court's jurisdiction uh, for war crimes committed in its territory. Um, but thinking about the crime of aggression, um, there might be some other options for bringing Vladimir Putin to justice for having committed that crime. There's been some debate out there about maybe creating a, a standalone or ad hoc war crimes tribunal uh, to try that sort of uh, crime. Um, General McDaniel, what are your thoughts on that option or, or some of the proposals that are out there? Well, I think we can do a, I think we can do a give and take because I think we may differ on this one. Um, as you point out, um, International Criminal Court can take jurisdiction over war crimes because, as you said, Ukraine uh, has acceded to the jurisdiction or requested jurisdiction from the International Criminal Court in at least one prior case. So there's an acceptance of jurisdiction, even if they're not a signatory to that. But as you say, crime of aggression is much different. So the previous cases where we see these higher level crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, uh, I'm thinking obviously the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslav or for uh, Rwanda, uh, you know, th they were by the Security Council. And uh, while uh, the Security Council, you've got 15 members, five of whom are permanent, so you need a supermajority, nine of 15, given, as you said, uh, the vote by the General Assembly uh, uh, against the Russian invasion, the, the most of the members, I think, that are on the Security Council would probably vote, except you've got to have, the, you've got to have an affirmative vote from the five permanent members, uh, and Russia clearly will not uh, uh, vote uh, for this. So the question then is, um, can, you have, can you have another body create an international tribu criminal tribunal uh, to consider the crime of aggression? And I think uh, we both are thinking about the General Assembly of the United Nations and whether all 146, I think it is, members uh, could, vo could vote to do this. And I'm a little hesitant as to whether or not the charter, the UN Charter permits that. You know, the language for the Security Council in the Charter talks about uh, the ability to uh, create or, or use all non-coercive measures uh, to assure compliance with international law, including international humanitarian law. There's not similar language for the General Assembly. And so I, I have to assume that that distinction between the, the, the authorities for the two bodies was in, intentional and meant to exclude the General Assembly from creating a, a, a subordinate you know, criminal courts for purposes such as this. What do you think, Professor Finnegan? I, I uh, tend to agree that there is a question whether the General Assembly of the United Nations by itself or on its own has the authority to create a, an ad hoc or standalone war crimes tribunal. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, quick thoughts on that. There are a couple of other proposals floating around out there uh, that are currently being debated that might get around that, that problem. One, one proposal is, and this is something that's been um, advocated by a group of European lawyers and scholars, is for a number of countries to get together to pool their jurisdictions to create an ad hoc tribunal to prosecute war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, and that would use as a model the Nuremberg trials following World War II. And in my view, there are two problems with that approach. One is a problem of legitimacy. I mean, if you just have a small number of Western countries, let's say NATO allies get together to create the court or the tribunal, 
and you don't have broader international participation, um, that calls into question the credibility or the legitimacy of those proceedings. I think another uh, possible problem with that approach, and again, now we're sort of getting into the weeds of legal technicalities here, but uh, it raises the specter of immunity that um, before the domestic courts of a country, foreign heads of state, foreign presidents enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution for reasons having to do with uh, sovereignty, the sovereignty of, of, of countries. And so if, if states get together and pool their jurisdiction, uh, there's an argument to be made that Vladimir Putin, as the president of Russia, would be immune from criminal prosecution before such a court. But, but another possibility that's being debated is for a tribunal to be created by a treaty, an agreement between the United Nations and Ukraine based on you know, joint recommendations of both Ukraine and the General Assembly. In that way, you avoid uh, an attempt by the General Assembly on its own to create a, a, a tribunal. Instead, you have a tribunal created by treaty. And this, there's precedent for this approach. Um, and the, the two most notable examples are the Special Court for Sierra Leone yep. and the Extraordinary Chambers, the court that was created in Cambodia to investigate uh, crimes of genocide there. And it, some advantages to that approach is that I, I think it's, in my opinion, there would be no grounds for head of state immunity that would protect Vladimir Putin. Uh, that type of tribunal would enjoy a fairly high degree of legitimacy because of both uh, General Assembly uh, recommendation and also the involvement of Ukraine. Um, and it would avoid the specter of a Security Council veto as uh, General McDaniel suggested. And I, I should also add finally that that approach would be consistent with the Ukrainian constitution. There is a provision in the constitution of Ukraine which prohibits the creation of special courts that are not otherwise recognized in the constitution. A, an international tribunal created by treaty, I think would, have, would kind of avoid that constitutional prohibition. Yeah, that's a great point. And that may be a great point to end this, this, this discussion on. So uh, I, I just wanna emphasize for our listeners, the, the one point that you made about legitimacy, uh, it's not enough for NATO or the European Union to say we're gonna create this court and, or even all the countries that surround Ukraine, assuming you could get Belarus and, and Moldova, which is probably concerned about aggression itself uh, to agree. It, you know, it has to be uh, true worldwide legitimacy. So uh, I, I absolutely agree and, and that the idea of creating uh, a, a similar court as was used in Sierra Leone uh, very effectively against Charles Taylor and the, uh, the ravages uh, that his army brought to Sierra Leone is a perfect example. And hopefully that'll be a model or a template that can be used. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, you know, Taylor uh, did not evade justice by being able to claim immunity right. given the international nature of that court. Maybe a similar model can be followed uh, here. All right, well, I think that's a good way to wrap things up uh, for uh, our discussion today. Thank you all.